Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 157, March 18th to March 24th, 1864. Last week, we talked about the opening of the Red River Campaign. The timeline, I think, will be messed up a little bit moving forward, so we might just jump around a bit. But the good news is that we are going to have to get kind of busy pretty soon, so there are going to be some action-packed episodes on the horizon. This week, we have a couple scattered events, including briefly talking about the CSS Alabama and heading to Colorado. First, though, we have another great example of a letter from Winter Quarters at Bristow Station. Before we do that, though, of course, we need to talk about the Patreon content, and uh, this month, of course, we're going through some movie reviews here. We would had our dual movie review of The Beguiled, and we did something a little bit different by reviewing two movies. It's essentially a remake of the first movie, very similar movies, but... There's a surprisingly good amount of stuff to draw on if we're going to talk about Civil War and the historical accuracy of the films. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, that has been posted to the Patreon feed. And, of course, those proceeds do go toward the general upheaval of the show, and they are greatly appreciated. So here we have our letter from an individual in the Fifth Corps. Dear Father, your letter dated the 19th at the Continental has been received by the mail of today. I say your letter, the letters of the boys, to you rather as you did not write much. I received your letter of the 15th and answered it, but as you said nothing about it, I suppose you have not received it. I received news from five of the family yesterday, Ma, Frank, Miles, Bing, and Mary. Those sick seemed to be convalescent. There is nothing of importance transpiring here at present. We have been on the Quai Vive, expecting a visit from Jeb Stewart. The guards along the railroads have been doubled for the past three or four days, and this command has been put under arms before daylight in the morning several times. Yesterday morning, we had quite a bustle. The long roll was beaten, and everything was in readiness, to give the expected raiders a welcome, but they have not come as of yet, and I do not expect them. It was reported that Stuart had crossed the Rappahannock near Falmouth with 5,000 men. This accounts for the scare. We are expecting General Grant to take charge of us this week. Nobody has any objection to his superintending matters here, yet General Meade is well liked by the soldiers of this army. I see by the papers that the veterans' regiments of the state of Ohio are ordered to the Army of the Potomac. This is a step in the right direction. Give us an overwhelming force here if we are to storm earthworks and entrenchments as we go on to Richmond. The president is doing well in calling out so large a force, for if Lee would attempt another Maryland and Pennsylvania campaign, we might not boast of another Gettysburg. What would our condition be if we had been routed on that bloody field? When I think of it, I do not wonder that people of Philadelphia wept for joy when the telegraph bore the news to them that the enemy had been beaten. I had a letter yesterday from an officer of the staff of Brigadier General George H. Thomas at Chattanooga. He thinks that there will not be as heavy fighting there for some months to come as there was in the fall. Veterans are returning and recruits are still coming for the army. If you look at the Philadelphia Inquirer of the either 19th, 10th, or 21st, I don't mind which, you will see in the Harrisburg letter something that pleases or will please us all. It states that the PRVCs will be mustered out in three years' time from the date of muster into the state service, so good news there. The Rockland boys here are well as usual. I'll write to you at any time you wish, as we have a daily mail. If you leave Philadelphia, keep me posted. If you received the other letter I wrote you, you can give me a long answer if you tell me all I asked. I will close for this time. So, lots to unpack here in this letter. Pretty good snapshot into 
the state of affairs that is going around in you know the Bristow Station area during the winter quarters. We have some expected raiding by the Confederates and notably Jeb Stewart. And this is not necessarily something that actually happens, but it is something that Stewart had done in previous campaigns. You know, we talked about how he sends the famous telegraph that says, I'm where he is, right? When he kind of raids behind Union lines, he's known for riding around these armies. So that's constantly going to be a worry, especially if you're in enemy territory. So Stewart, also Mosby, right? You're all constantly worried about Confederate raiders operating in your rear. We also have the news that General Grant is taking over for the Army. And this would have been, uh, there's a lot of mixed reception for him as he takes over, right? But there, this probably would have been the most common, at least in the sources that I've seen, that I've gone over, is that he's successful. He has a track record of success. So the common soldier is going to be okay with Grant coming in because they know he's a winner. However, there is a certain affiliation with George Gordon Meade in that Meade wins the Battle of Gettysburg. And even in this letter, so even in the winter here, he's still writing about the events of Gettysburg in a sense of saying, you know, if we had been beaten, it would have been bad, right? So he's still thinking about that that pretty pivotal battle. And Meade having won that, and then during the subsequent campaigning where they get back into Virginia, he's very reluctant to throw men at Confederate works. So that's going to be much like McClellan. He's going to win some praise from the common soldier because he's not willing to waste lives in a futile attempt to try to gain earthworks or what have you. So that's an interesting look and I think a pretty common attitude toward Grant and Meade at this stage. Finally, in this letter, we can also talk about how there are individuals that are coming into the army, right? There's always the call for volunteers. The Union Army is constantly going to have this problem where the enlistment periods are expiring. You know, we talked about that even back in 1862, and you know, notably Joe Hooker trying to rebuild the army after Fredericksburg. It's a tough task because there are a lot of soldiers that are going home, and then you end up having you know, certain enlistment periods. And that's another thing I don't think we necessarily think about too often is that the individuals who are garrisoning even some of these border states, they're going to be having lesser enlistment periods. So we talked about United States colored troops and their roles in their protecting supply lines and being part of the general support system. But then you also have these individuals who are coming on for lesser enlistment periods. So they're not going to waste time getting all the way to the front as combat troops. They're not going to be as effective as combat troops. So we have a lot of those individuals as well. So it's constantly kind of a churning machine if, uh, if we think about it that way. So we have mentioned in the past when we talked about Confederate commerce raiders, the CSS Alabama, probably the most famous of the rebel warships, but we have not really gone too far in depth. The Alabama was built in England in 1862, although it was not allowed to be armed in that nation due to the neutrality of Great Britain. Even though the British would eventually supply cannon for the vessel, this would have to be done outside of the nation. So the ship would sail to the Azores, where it would be fitted with a crew and guns, including Raphael Sims, who we have spoken about before. We should consider that federal and confederate agents are operating abroad because there are those who are brokering this deal and those who are reporting about that intelligence. The U.S. Navy would try to stop the Alabama before she could start her career, but was unsuccessful in intercepting her from Liverpool. We'll get into it when we talk about the fight at Cherbourg, France, here later in the year, but there is a squadron, smaller squadron, that operates abroad for the U.S. Navy, and they're going to be tasked with trying to bottle up these raiders before they can even get out into sea. As it was, the crew of the Alabama would be 145, although this was probably not fully manned. Sims would actually have trouble in acquiring enough men before setting out. He would need to offer up signing bonuses to men in the Azores. <laughs> 
As a result, most of the crew would actually be British, making for an interesting dynamic. As far as armament goes, the Alabama would sport 632 pounders, and that would be part of the broadside, as well as a heavy 110 pounder and a 68 pound cannon. She could travel at 13 knots and move either by sail or by steam. Interestingly, the Alabama was built with a submersible stack to hide the fact that she could be moved by that way. This sail and steam combination could provide the extra speed that a Commerce Raider would need. During her career, she would capture and destroy 65 enemy merchant ships. Each of these would be forced to surrender, have their crew removed, and then destroyed. This would be an extremely effective strategy, causing some $6 million in damage, which in modern money would be somewhere in the ballpark of $112 million. There would be various expeditions set out by the Alabama all around the globe as well. This would take her from New England to the Gulf of Mexico and even the South Pacific. As you could imagine, this would be important to the international perception of the Confederacy. While ultimately not successful, having a naval vessel in international ports as far as the South Pacific would go toward the prestige of the nation, especially if you're trying to be recognized as a legitimate nation in the eyes of some of these foreign powers. Think back to the U.S. Navy and their journey to Japan, which did add to the legitimacy of the United States, as well as being for exploration to a pretty isolated nation. The Confederacy was isolated as well, so to speak, with the Union Army and Navy constricting on the south. Now there would be a total of seven expeditions around the globe. These journeys would take them to places such as Cape Town in South Africa and the Straits of Malacca, as well as France. Heavy raiding had occurred in 1863, which included the lion's share of the captures made by the Alabama, preying mostly on Yankee clippers. U.S. Navy vessels would be sent to deal with the Alabama, but so far they had been unsuccessful. Sims would look to the beginning of 1864 as an opportunity to refit his ship after their heavy workload. He would turn her toward friendly France so that she could be once again brought up to speed. We will hold that thought as we get into the summer of 1864. 534 of 657 days had been at sea, and the rebels had not been to a Confederate port. 450 ships had been boarded, with 65 being burned, 2,000 prisoners taken, and amazingly, no loss of life to the Alabama's crew. This does speak to the effective nature of the Raiders. I want to spend the remainder of the episode discussing the Western United States and what's been going on there. It's been a while since we talked about the American Southwest specifically. Remember, we had the Texan invasion of 1862 and a pipe dream of a Confederate port in California so that the southern states could spread all the way to the Pacific. Kind of ties nicely into what we were just talking about with the legitimacy of the Confederacy sending vessels out into international waters and if you have a port on that side that can be supplied, so much the better. While the invasion had ended in failure, the region was not without its continued conflict, as we will soon get into, and of course you remember, the three-cornered war we have talked about before. While no Confederates were making wild plans to turn the tide in the area, the Lincoln administration was interested in Colorado and Nevada especially. Both of these areas were significant when it came to mining. Colorado had seen a gold rush in 1859 at Pikes Peak, and in Nevada, there had been found the Comstock Lode, that being silver in Virginia City the same year. Precious metals, of course, are always an interest to a good many people. You see, these are still territories out in the West, not yet states, who could be used in potential elections. We have already mentioned how pro-union governments were being established to gain legitimacy. Of course, we talked about that in terms of that being a major goal, or at least one of the goals, of the Red River campaign. You can understand how these moves were with one eye on the 1864 elections. Nevada and Colorado, the latter of which had already contributed troops, making an impact on the war effort, 
were seen as legit chances to get more pro-Republican members into the House of Representatives. Colorado would vote on whether to become a state, and unfortunately, those voting, the majority of the population not voting, would choose to remain a territory. If you are going to become a state in the United States, obviously, we kind of saw that with Texas, and Texas, of course, is a little bit different because it, it was its own nation, but you're kind of having to comply with federal regulations at that point, and there's going to be more oversight into what you're doing. And obviously, if you're making a lot of money uh, mining or what have you, gold, silver, then, yeah, you're probably not going to want the government to come in and start regulating that, even if there is certain benefits to being a state in the union. Nevada, who had split from the Utah Territory in 1861, would fare better, becoming officially the 37th state in October. So we had West Virginia and now Nevada as a result of the Civil War becoming states when they did. So keep that in mind, maybe at trivia or something. Now, Nevada would only have some 1,400 men serving for the Union, many of which would not see combat, and ultimately their addition as a state was not necessary for Lincoln to win in the 1864 election. Spoiler alert. They did have a motto on their flag being Battleborn, which is a direct link to having been created during the Civil War. We may have briefly mentioned the Sanitary Commission in some of our previous episodes. This commission would be to help wounded soldiers in their recovery, and part of the goal, of course, would be to raise money toward this effort. Nevada would contribute the most money toward this raising of funds during the war, which of course is a great contribution, and sort of surprising if you think of the lower population the former territory contained. In modern day money, it would be the equivalent of $3 million. Silver mining or otherwise profiting off that business would be quite lucrative, it seems. Now let's talk a little bit about Colorado as well in our little mini tour of the West. Colorado, of course, would not be a state, but that did not mean they did not see any type of action during this period. We have mentioned the Fort Laramie Treaty when mentioning the Plains tribes, perhaps going back to talking a little bit about the Sioux and their resistance in 1862. This agreement would be signed with several tribes, including the Sioux from this region, the Arapaho, Kiowa, and Cheyenne. Of course, the problem with all these treaties is that they're only going to last until there is something worth having an encroachment onto the territory you have promised these tribes. And if you've been paying attention, we just talked about the gold rush as well as the Comstock load. So I'd be willing to guess that you probably already picked up on what's going to happen. Well, the tribes who did sign the treaty would then have to give up more land to accommodate getting at this area that is mineral rich. Remember too that those of European ancestry often made the mistake of assuming that if one chief signed a treaty, then they spoke for the whole. We know from some of our previous episodes that this is very much not the case, especially in that culture, which was very independent. Tensions would mount with the tribes, especially if they made contact with U.S. soldiers sent to protect the area. Now, we have spoken about some of these troops before in reference to some of the actions, including the New Mexico invasion. The Union High Command, especially with Grant at the helm, is going to want every available man they could to get their planned offensives off the ground. So despite there being some scattered Confederate sympathizers, it was deemed that these troops could be used elsewhere. Specifically, they could be sent to Kansas so that there could be a great shuffling. One of the individuals in the area, though, was Colonel John Shivington, who we know from Gloria Pass, the arguable hero of that action for destroying the crucial Confederate baggage train. Soldiers under Shivington would be involved in minor skirmishes with natives, including the famous Dog Soldiers. Dog Soldiers were a warrior society within the Cheyenne who would be primarily involved against the white encouragement into the West. It's actually speculated by some that Shivington was intentionally creating these actions so that he could remain in Colorado, as moving east to Kansas, and maybe even farther, was something he didn't want to do. You might have to make a call on that on whether you want to take your chances against the dog soldiers and you're very, very rarely ever going to see them. You know, there's going to be some hit and run tactics probably. There's not going to be any major battles that 
Obviously, there's still some danger there if you're involved with a warrior society or if you're going out further east into, say, Kansas and you're getting involved with maybe bushwhackers or even as we're going to see a brief Confederate foray into Missouri, which is going to involve some fixed battles, then that might not be as appealing. So you might have to take your pick there. Thus, the Colorado War, as it will be called, would begin in March of 1864, with soldiers mostly confronting bands of these hostile tribes for stealing mules or horses from the military. Now we will get into the relative conclusion, or at least the most famous event involved in the Colorado War, that being the massacre at Sand Creek later in November. This will also include Shivington, so stay tuned for that, although it will be a long time coming, with a lot of things in between. But it is still good to have an introduction to at least see what is tying down troops that could otherwise be sent east. While we are on the subject of conflicts with natives, we do need to talk about another ongoing conflict that would have action going on in 1864. This would be the Bald Hills War in California. Now we have talked about how there is not a whole lot in terms of action against Confederates if you were in California. The sort of exception being that there was a column from California which included native Californians that would go to New Mexico and skirmish a little bit with some Arizona Confederates. Now, they kind of miss out on the entire 1862 Texas invasion campaign, right? But at least they are involved in some action. Well, we have the Bald Hills War, which would include some action between the Wilcott people and California volunteers. Humboldt County would be the site of this conflict, and of course, we have a common theme to our stories here today. This region will be cultivated by farmers in order to provide logistical support for miners in the area. Obviously, this encroachment and the crossing of the Wilcut land would lead to tensions and war in the late 1850s. This unfortunately would also include militias engaging against the peaceful Wyatt people in what would become known as the Indian Island Massacre. Most of the elderly women and children would be victims, of this massacre that estimates the casualty figures ranging from 150 to 250, with the majority of them perishing. We have a particularly graphic account from a California newspaper. Blood stood in pools on all sides, the walls of the huts were stained, and the grass colored red. Lying around were dead bodies of both sexes and all ages from the old man to the infant at the breast. Some had their heads split in twain by axes, others beaten into jelly with clubs, others pierced or cut to pieces with bowie knives. Some struck down as they mired, others had almost reached the water, when overtaken and butchered. So obviously not a very pretty picture there, and we will talk, unfortunately, about additional massacres when we get into the Sand Creek Massacre, as we mentioned in Colorado in November of 1864. Colonel Francis Lippitt, a Rhode Island native, would take over the Humboldt Military District in 1861 after the outbreak of the war. He would set about trying to bring the region to heel, especially considering many of the farmers had abandoned their lands. They would wage a pretty effective war against Lippitt, controlling much in terms of the territory. In fact, given the heavily wooded terrain of the region, it was punctuated by smaller-scale skirmishing, which of course is not conducive when you want to bring on a decisive engagement. Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Whipple, who would go on to participate in Crook's campaigns against the Apache, would take over for Lippitt in 1863 and begin campaigning once again into 1864. He would kill or capture many of the natives in the region by implementing a policy of more frequent patrols and skirmishing. Previously, the natives had been able to escape reservations, but this more rigorous activity would pacify the area. So, we will bring today to a close. This week, we talked about the CSS Alabama and her activity all around the world. Eventually, the buck is going to stop for the effective Confederate commerce raider, but we will get there soon enough. 
We also spent some time in Nevada, Colorado, and California to discuss events going on in the West. Hopefully you have a better idea that there are still events happening even in these places that you probably wouldn't expect. Next week we'll spend some time in Kentucky and then check back in on the campaigning that's happening in Louisiana. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Post in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback's always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>